Well, thank you, Jim, and I'm honored, actually, beyond honored for that introduction. Um, it's, it's somewhat ironic that I've become famous for making an apology, because as my wife would tell you, apologizing is something I'm not very good at. <laughs> and you know, I like to think my personal motto is never apologize and never explain. But today, I'm not going to apologize, because I've already done that, but I am going to explain the process how that apology came about. Now the doors are closed, and we can have a private conversation with just a few people watching. I want to tell you what happened to me over the last 15 or so years. Now let's start by winding the clock back to 1998. Here I am in this photo. I think that is me. I'm not joking. I recognize the suit. And there we are, there I am, busily trashing an oilseed rape crop at a farm-scale trial somewhere near Oxford um, back in 1998. So let's back up even further than this. What got me to that stage? Well, as a child, I spent three formative years in what may be the world's most spe ge geographically spectacular and beautiful country, Peru. I went to school in Lima, and I learned all about the Incas and how they set up this marvelous civilization, even without the use of the wheel, in the inhospitable land, uh, landscape of the Andes. And that landscape captivated me. I can still remember every aspect of it today. But seeing it despoiled by unregulated mining activities, such as in this mining town of La Oroya in the central Andes, was something I will never forget. And I think... That's what turned me in initially into an environmentalist. And I tell you, if you'd driven through that town and you'd seen the way it was, and you'd seen the kids who were polluted by the toxic metals, you would have had the same reaction. Now, this would never happen today in a developed country. And in those days, this was in about 1980. Peru was a desperately poverty-stricken country. And this is another of my formative memories, is of seeing young children in the Central Valley, under the shadow of Peru's highest mountain, with pot bellies from malnutrition. And we used to drive through the Andes in our battered old Land Rover, and as we went from hairpin bend to hairpin bend down these big, long valleys, the kids would run from one bend to the other, and we would have the windows open, and we'd be throwing money out into their hats, like sort of royalty passing in a gilded carriage. Now, I didn't know the word at the time, because I was only eight years old, but what we were seeing was, of course, um, real poverty. And some of those kids that we gave money to probably have since died of malnutrition um, and other preventable diseases before being able to grow up. And none of them, I would be prepared to bet, have enjoyed the privileges and opportunities that I've um, had in my life. So I grew up determined to see a more equal world and one where poverty becomes a thing of the past rather than a permanent state of being for the majority of the world's population. And you know, since those days, the world has made great progress in reducing poverty. Um, and I think the end of absolute poverty is at last in sight, which is something I never thought I would see. But um, we returned to England in 1982 and lived in a house in the country. And I used to travel, uh, just used to go around. I used to pick mushrooms. I can tell you the names, the Latin names of all of the mushrooms, edible and poisonous, that I used to find. And you can test me on this later if you don't believe me. Um, so in Peru, I'd seen jungle, I'd seen mountains, I'd seen deserts, but England has sort of nat natural attractions of a gentler sort, um, of this rolling green countryside, and also the connection you have with the past. I, we lived in a village which had been there for a thousand years. And my father was a geologist, that's why we were in Peru, and in retrospect, I wish I'd discovered the joys of science a little earlier in my life. Um, instead, I, I dropped science at the age of 16, as you do when you're no good at maths in the British educational system, and went to history two years later to study, uh, sorry, went to Edinburgh two years later to study history and politics. Uh, I did a dissertation on environmental politics. I found an in, uh, environment page on the student newspaper. And when I left university, um, I was a, kind of a fully fledged environmentalist and ready to go on and join the emerging protest scene at the time. Now, in the 1990s, this was very much a direct action type movement. Uh, the, the, the general banner was this Earth First 
um, no compromise in defense of Mother Earth. You know, we were going back to the land. We used to sit around fires and believe that we were building some kind of alternative society. And occasionally people would fall in love under the trees and in the mud, and it was all very nice. <laughs> um, some of this was focused around the roads protests. They were building big new motorways everywhere, and we were trying to protect these ancient landscapes of England against the bulldozers and the tarmac. Um, now, if, if, if my information at that point came from environmental groups, if, something, if I had a report or some piece of literature came which had a Greenpeace logo on it, I considered that to be gospel, even if the references at the back of the Greenpeace report would tend to be to Friends of the Earth, and at the back of a Friends of the Earth report would tend to be to Greenpeace. Uh, at the time, that was good enough for me. Now, I was 23, full of righteous passion, as all 23-year-olds should be. And it was at that moment when I first heard about those evil geniuses over at Monsanto. <laughs> and what I heard and what I believed was that this was a big American, American with a capital A, corporation, which was causing genetic pollution by transferring DNA between unrelated species in a way which had never been done before in an effort to control the entire, and dominate the entire food chain through intellectual property, through patenting. And our response to this was direct action. We went into the field, day or night, wherever these mutant crops were being, grown, were being grown, and we destroyed them, we trashed them. We called it decontamination. Um, I personally hired buses, I printed leaflets, we made banners, and we invaded the Monsanto headquarters in the UK. This was back in about 1997, I think. Regrettably, this was the most successful campaign I was ever involved with. We had an unusual political coalition behind us. We had the Daily Mail, a right-wing tabloid. We had Prince Charles, a left-wing royal um, monarch-to-be. We had the yogic flyers at the Natural Law Party, and we had half of the British public who'd been terrified by the BSE mad cow disease scare just a few years earlier, and saw this as the latest trend in technological laboratory-based food contamination. And if I, if I look back, I think we kind of opposed technology and agriculture. The Stuart Brand quote that, um, that Jim read is very apposite because this was very much a romantic view of the past and therefore a romantic view of the future and how food should be produced in a very personal way using old-fashioned tools. We used to sing songs about the Luddites as having been historically misunderstood. And <laughs> we proposed organic and permaculture as the obvious, unquestionable solutions that the whole world should adopt. And I think we saw farmers in pretty negative light as ecological villains who, for some reason, were determined to spray these nefarious agrochemicals across our food supply for no apparent reason other than sheer malice. Now, note that there are some, some genuine reasons for concern here. Um, perhaps looking back, we can say that the precautionary approach was sensible. Um, the techniques for recombining DNA at a molecular level were unproven in terms of being adopted on a large scale in the food supply, and maybe we were right to be instinctively cautious. But, as I say, any real precaution was wrapped in a much broader agenda, which I think I would retrospectively identify as anti-science um, and even anti-modern. It was, you know, we, we certainly preferred adjectives like holistic to anything resembling real empirical data. Um, and this was also about values, and it was about gut instincts and an emotional commitment, which is even deeper than the political commitments that you might have between being Democrat and Republican. And I presume this is a Republican audience here today. Um, oh, no, Democrat, sorry. Um, but, you know, this is ideology, and it's pure... In <laughs> I've just done something terribly, terribly wrong, haven't I? <laughs> But this is ideology in its purest form, and it's very difficult to, to challenge or, or change or get people to question. Um, and it leaves very little room for dissent. Now, one of the reasons why I can't complain about being called a traitor, or worse now, is that I have to 
recognize how intolerant of alternative viewpoints I was personally at that stage and how kind of authoritarian was my belief system. I knew how everyone should live their lives, and I was determined to, to make that happen. Um, you, you may or may not have heard of a Danish academic, Bjorn Lomborg, but he published a book in 2001 which criticized environmentalists and environmentalism for exaggerating the problems as he perceived. So what I did, well, I called him a liar, and I threw a cream pie in his face in an Oxford bookshop. Um, now, the video of this is still on YouTube, but I'm not going to show it to you because it's too damned embarrassing, um, and that, not just because I'm still wearing the same suit. <laughs> but uh, in case you're wondering, I have since then made a kind of a reconciliation with Bjorn. I, I um, apologize privately to him about that, and we've, we've um, had a lot of interesting conversations, and even though I don't agree with everything he says now, um, I did learn a lesson from the fact that he was always gracious to me, even though I'd kind of attacked him with a cream pie, <laughs> rather than angry and hostile. So that was the lesson. Perhaps the other lesson that I learned from him was if you're going to dish it out, you have to be able to take it. So I guess I would have probably burned Lomborg's book in the streets back then, but I was also beginning to write my own books. Um, and this is what began to lead me into a very different world than the one I'd previously been involved in, the activist world. Now, my first book was called High Tide, and it was about climate change. And my idea was to travel around the world. This was back in 2000, and this was a novel idea at the time. It doesn't seem like it now. But the idea was to travel around the world and witness the first impacts of climate change in different geographical locations and for di with different people. Um, and I called this High Tide News from a Warming World. The first place I went to was in Alaska, this little Eskimo community called Shishmarif um, on the west coast. It's about where Sarah Palin can see Russia from. Um, and the, the village elders told me that the community was eroding into the sea because the sea ice was no longer there for much of the year because of the warming temperatures. Um, the storms were getting more extreme and more sudden and more unpredictable. And the <coughs> environment that they'd grown up in, and you heard this from the elders particularly, was changing in front of their very eyes. But of course, these are anecdotal reports. And I knew enough to realize that data isn't the plural of anecdote, and I wanted to see what the real data was saying. And that meant that I had to start familiarizing myself with the scientific um, publications which were out there on this topic. So I needed to know whether what I was hearing in this little village in Shishmarev represented a broader, sustained trend over the Arctic. And I had to therefore look at the satellite records. Um, but remember, I'm a history graduate. I'm a politics graduate. So I found myself almost unable to read these papers, and I had to learn a new language. It was like learning Esperanto from scratch. Um, I had to learn all of the technical jargon, I had to familiarize myself with the statistical methodologies, learn to read beyond the abstract and the conclusion, and also begin to understand a bit about what, what the sort of pecking order was of these different journals, what made a good paper and what didn't make a good paper. And so I tried to apply this in different places I visited. I went to the drowning Pacific island of Tuvalu in the South Pacific, where tide gauge records and satellite altimetry confirm that sea level rise is happening, um, as we know it's happening on a global level, and is therefore a, a real and present danger to the survival of the state. And I went back to Peru. Um, this was uh, on the left. This is now a famous photo because it was used in Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, even though he wrongly identified the location as being in Argentina. Um, <laughs> this is in Peru. And the photo on the left was taken by my father of a glacier in the Cordillera Blanca, where he was working doing geological mapping. And when I went back in 2002, lo and behold, the glacier had gone. And that's the only use of the F word in the entire book, um, was my response to seeing that. 22 years, the whole glacier had disappeared. And that kind of change is now evident across mountain ranges right across the world. And how do I know that? Well, I know that from the scientific data and the scientific evidence I was looking at. So I locked myself down into the basement of the Radcliffe Science Library at my home in Oxford for two whole years. And during that time, I gradually fell in love. And I fell in love with a process, a method, um, an idea. And I guess I found my inner geek, you could say, uh, which had been previously repressed by my training in the liberal arts. <laughs> so 
That doesn't normally get a laugh. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so science is so uh, simple and so beautiful, and I was thinking maybe this is the greatest gift that humanity has bestowed on itself over the past four centuries, is this learning to have the reasoned use of objective data. Um, as a history graduate, we'd had this book called The Age of Reason. I was studying the 18th century, and I never really thought what the title meant, but now I've begun to understand. Um, and as an environmentalist, I've been very attuned to ideology. I've been very attuned to assertion and force of argument. But science seemed to offer something different, something more powerful and more profound, a sort of objective window into reality. Um, and crucially, it can change when presented with new and compelling evidence. There's a great quote from Tim Minchin. Do you know him? He's the guy who wrote this new Broadway musical, Matilda, based on the Roald Dahl book. I just love this. Science adjusts its views on, based on what's observed. Faith is the denial of observation so that belief can be preserved. This is actually a song. He sings it, but I'm not going to <laughs> attempt it. Um, anyway, little by little, I found over the coming years my faith based activist view of the world coming into contradiction with my increasingly scientific one and in no area more than my original campaigning battleground of GMOs. So studying climate change was the easy part because my faith and my science were pretty well aligned. And what Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and the environmental groups were saying about climate change was broadly correct, according to the scientific evidence I was looking at. And whilst you can argue about specific uncertainties in the science, and it's, it's, that is the right thing to do, it's, it certainly wasn't the case that the Greens, the environmentalists, were the denial, denialists in this area. Um, it was really the political right who objected ideo ideologically to the whole idea of climate change and absurdly tried to pretend that the whole thing didn't <laughs> exist. So I spent much of my time in those years cutting my teeth in the media, arguing vociferously against the climate change deniers. And how did I know I was right? Well, because I'd read the science. That was my, that was my position. I'd read hundreds of scientific papers. I'd assessed countless data sets examining climatology, paleoclimatology, oceanography, glaciology. It was fantastic to go across all of these different broad areas. And I knew I was right because I was defending a scientific consensus on this issue, where 97% of experts, or whatever the figure was, agreed that this was the truth. My second book was called Six Degrees. Um, as Jim mentioned, this was made into a film by National Geographic. And once again, I rode into battle against the um, climate change deniers, even doing a tour in the United States, which at that time, this was just as politicized, if not more so than it is today. Um, and yet I wasn't applying this objectivity to myself at the time. Um, here's, the, here's something I wrote in 2008, and this was my very last anti-GMO article. And I think it was writing this that made me realize that I no longer believed it. So this was my aha moment, if you like, partly which came from reading the comments underneath. This is still online, so you can see all of those comments. Some of them are quite amusing. Um, and, but they did force me to think seriously about, about changing my mind. And I'd already begun to come into conflict with my environmentalist allies because of speaking publicly in support of nuclear power. Um, it's absurd to want to remove the, one of the world's lowest, largest low-carbon power sources at the same time as you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by phasing out fossil fuels. There's an obvious contradiction there, yet it's one which is denied in a denialist way by the environmental movement, by the people who are my allies. So I suddenly found out what it was like to be vilified and called a traitor and subject to emotional blackmail via email or whatever. Um, and it was quite unpleasant, but I'm quite a stubborn person and I don't like being bullied. So that made me look even further into this issue. Um, and I found out that what the environmentalists have been saying about nuclear power simply wasn't true or was a, a, a misconception of what the truth was in this area. And, if, and in fact, to skip forward to the present day, there's a, a movie called Pandora's Promise, which tells the whole story of nuclear power. I'm in the movie. Other environmentalists, including Stuart Brand, also play leading roles in this film. And um, you can see it on Friday. It's going to be showing in St. Louis and in many other theaters around the country. What's the theater called? The Frontenac. Is that a real word? 
Okay. You know what? Do you know what that means? Okay. If you if you be there, you'll pack it out. So please, please go. Anyway. Anyway, anyway. Believe, believe me, I didn't um, really relish refighting this kind of battle um, when it came to the subject of GMOs. And it took me three years to write about this um, in my in my later book, um, the, God, the God Species. And I was very restrained and subtle and nuanced in the language that I used in that book, which is why no one read it and no one noticed what I was saying. Um, <laughs> but I did feel a growing weight of responsibility, really moral responsibility, because I knew that what I'd done in those days in the anti-GM movement, movement had probably done real damage in the world, both to the environment and to food security, and to the reputation of the institution of science, which I now, now held so dear. So my initial response was not to come out in the public and start shooting my mouth off. It was to work behind the scenes with some of the scientists who are, like many of you here today, working in the public sector to try and produce um, transgenic crops or non-transgenic crops, uh, but new forms of seeds which can help in, in the battle for food security. Uh, and, in the sense, and in transgenic crops, at least, we're under constant threat of attack from my former colleagues in the anti-GMO movement. Um, last summer, um, Rothamsted Research in the UK began running a trial of uh, GMO wheat, uh, which has, I don't know how much you know about this, but it has a gene inserted to produce uh, an aphid alarm pheromone called E-beta farnesine, which the aphids themselves produce naturally. Now, aphids, uh, as you will know, are, are a serious pest, insect pest of, of wheat and barley and other cereal crops. They are vectors for a viral disease. Um, I think it's called yellow barley dwarf virus, uh, which is a serious problem. And it's controlled, of course. The aphids are controlled by, by the spraying of insecticides. So potentially, if the wheat can express this pheromone itself, then you can reduce the use of chemicals in the field. So a very strong and powerful environmental argument could be made for why this might be a useful thing to do. And this was not Monsanto. This was Rothamsted. It was being supported and backed by public money. Um, and yet the anti-GMO activists who said they were obsessed with Monsanto were unable to recognize the difference. <laughs> and that was shocking to me. So anyway, working with the scientists, I, I um, encouraged them to, put, to speak up for themselves, for their own work. And to, one of the things that they did was put together this YouTube video, um, which I'm going to quickly show you because I think they put their case with, uh, both with evident passion and with some some measure of rhetorical flair, certainly for scientists. We have heard that protesters are planning to attack our GMV trial site on the 27th of May. We ask them to please consider our message in the spirit of openness and dialogue. We know we cannot stop you taking the action you're planning to take, but please reconsider before it's too late and before Several years' worth of work to which we have been devoting our lives will be destroyed forever. We appeal to you as environmentalists. We agree that agriculture should work with nature rather than against it. And in fact, that is what we are trying to do with our plants. We have developed this new variety of wheat which doesn't require treatment with an insecticide and it uses a natural aphid repellent which already widely occurs in nature and is produced by more than 400 different plant species. We have engineered this into the wheat genome so that the wheat can do the same thing to defend itself. Are you really against this because it could have a lot of environmental benefit? Or is it simply because you distrust it because it's a GMO? The suggestion that our wheat is part cow is simply not true. The gene that we have added was synthetically made in the lab. And even with regular plant breeding, the wheat that we grow today has undergone many genetic changes. Our research is to shed light on questions about safety and usefulness of new varieties of staple food crops which we all depend on. We must stress that this trial is for research purposes only, for gathering knowledge. It is not being commercially grown. As activists, you may prefer never to know whether our new wheat variety would work, but we believe you're in the minority. You seem to think even before we've had a chance to test the trial, that RGM wheat variety is bad. But how can you know this? It's clearly not through scientific investigation because we've not even had any chance to do any tests yet. You state on your website that 
there's serious doubt that the aphid alarm pheromone being produced by this GM wheat is going to have any effect anyway. And you could very well be right. But if you trash the trial, none of us are ever going to know, are we? And do you really want that? Our work is publicly funded. We have pledged that our results will not be patented and will not be owned by any private company. If our wheat proves to be beneficial, we want it to be made available to farmers at minimum cost. If you destroy publicly funded research, you leave us in a situation where only big corporations can afford the drastic security measures required to continue biotechnology research. And you therefore further promote a situation you say you are trying to avoid. Um, you may not know much about Rothamsted. You may not realise that we're the institute that has one of the longest running agricultural and environmental experiments in the world. Um, these are plots that have been receiving agricultural treatments and we've been measuring the ecological consequences of these since 1843. Now, some of these sensitive plots are very close to the GM trial site and we're really worried that people trampling these sites are going to compromise the ecological experiment that's been running for nearly 200 years. When you come to visit us on the 27th of May, please don't come in a spirit of destruction. Please come and engage in conversation with us. We would really like to show you our work and explain to you why we really think that it could benefit the environment in the future. As scientists, we know that we do not have all the answers, but that's why we need to conduct experiments. And that's why, please, we ask you not to destroy them. So, so what I love about that is not just that they're passionate, but they're, that they're so uncomfortable speaking about their work. Because that, it's not glossy, it's not PR, it's not polished, but they believe in what they're doing, and they put a human face on, on their research in a way which has never been the case in this debate before. And most important of all, they're humble. They're saying, we don't know the results, we don't even know whether this is going to work, but if you don't let us try it out, if you destroy the experiment before the results have even come in, then we will never know. And that was an important message, and it was one which resounded, um, I think, successfully with the UK public. Um, the scientists won the media battle on this issue. Um, and when the big promised day of action came about, that was all of them under that tree. And half of them had been bussed in from France. <laughs> exactly. And a piece of good news this morning, uh, Rothamsted is now, has just been granted um, approval. This is embargo till 12 p.m. UK time. I don't know whether I'm breaking the embargo in telling you, but... They sent a tweet. They sent a tweet. Oh, thank you. Thank you to the lady from Monsanto. Um, it's a... Uh... <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Um... But yes, anyway, so they're going to be repeating this in, in, in autumn wheat. The, it, was, it, was, it was trialed already in spring wheat. So the idea was to see whether it works in the field in different weather situations um, and different times. Uh, and once we know, then we'll know whether this um, can, ever be, can ever be used and can be used to benefit some um, farmers. One of the things which, uh, another wheat crop which was done by, uh, wheat trial which was done by CSIRO in Australia was destroyed by Greenpeace using um, weed whack, as they call them, strimmers. Um, there was something about this which really, really annoyed me. Um, I don't know what it was, given that I used to do this myself, but it came about um, later one of these trials showed a, 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 an unanticipated increase in yield of something like 30%. Um, you know, something like that could transform the prospects for future food security. Had Greenpeace managed to destroy the whole thing, we would never know. And that's the danger of what they're doing. And I also found out more about the campaign against golden rice. And if you look at, and they, the activists say that this isn't about the fact that golden rice is the GMO, they say it's an inappropriate into technological, techno-fix intervention, um, and, and we should be doing other things to protect food security. But uh, no one's opposed the introduction of an orange flesh sweet potato because it's non-GMO, and it's already out there in East Africa, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others, um, saving lives and saving the site of hundreds of thousands of children who would otherwise go blind each year um, because of vitamin A deficiency. So I, it just occurred to me that campaigning against this kind of intervention is 
no better than campaigning against immunization and against vaccination. It's not just a denial of science, but it's a denial of basic humanitarian values. And I didn't think, well, I thought, well, this is something ultimately I can't stay quiet about. And so by the time I was invited to speak at the Oxford Farming Conference in January this year, I had stopped caring about what my old friends in the Green Movement were thinking about me. And I could no longer maintain any pretense that the anti-GMO position was respectable or justified scientifically in any way uh, and was anything other than anti-science denialism of the very worst kind. And if we take a lesson from climate change science, the expert consensus is stated very clearly in numerous academic communications, such as this one from the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and it uses very unequivocal language about the scientific evidence being clear. Climate change is happening now. And yet there's an equivalent statement published by the, as well by the AAAS using the same kind of language. The science is clear that crop improvement using molecular bio, um, biotechnology, biotechnology is safe. So, and yet here were the green groups attacking the scientists in terms of this statement and in terms of this work spreading myths and propaganda which were not only evidence-free, but were the very opposite of objective reality. So I guess I thought it was time for me to break cover and, and, and speak out. And, a bit, and before giving the speech, I felt a little like um, you, you do when you know you're making a kind of a major life-changing decision, but you have no choice. That's how it felt. Uh, although I didn't expect to make headlines around the world, I didn't expect this speech to go, become this viral um, thing on the internet and to be viewed more than a million times within a week, and voluntarily translated into about a dozen languages now, um, including um, Vietnamese, um, Korean, um, and German. Even stranger. Um, <laughs> and there has been a certain amount of pushback. If you dish it out, as I say, you've got to be able to take it. So I kind of just tend to put up with this, this sort of thing. Um, and when I first spoke out publicly, a lot of scientists contacted me and said, you think you've got problems? <laughs> you think you've got hate mail? Welcome to my world. Um, so I knew I was in good company. But um, you know what bothers me about this image? That's not even me. <laughs> so they, they had to find a different corporate shill and take a photo of him, and I didn't make the grade, and I want to know why. Um, anyway, it's only been a few months since January, but... It feels like years, and I think that people were interested in my story not just because it's unusual for anyone to apologize about anything, um, or that there's anything particularly fascinating about me, but the, there was something beginning to change in the zeitgeist of this issue around the world, that increasing numbers of people were beginning to realize that the anti-GMO case was always a lie. And I made the comparison earlier with anti-vaccination campaigners. There's a lot of crossover in the movements, a lot of the same people are doing this, um, and I think there's a very clear parallel um, in both these campaigns. They mobilize under shadowy banners like natural health. Um, and there's oftentimes somebody making a lot of money out of other people's gullibility here. Um, so since my um, January speech in Oxford, I've actually found out that I was wrong about something. I actually underestimated the safety of GMO crops. I said that you're as likely to get hit by an asteroid as to get hurt by eating GMOs. And actually, I was wrong because there was an asteroid that hit Russia. <laughs> and so we now have data-based evidence for why you're much more likely to get hurt by an asteroid <laughs> than harmed by eating GMO crops. Anyway, I, so I say I hope and believe that today we've, uh, we are approaching or we're even crossing something of a tipping point where to be ideologically anti-GMO is increasingly seen for what it really is, which is to be reactionary, to be backward-looking, and against innovation, not just in agriculture, but potentially more widely as well. In India, activists have stopped the introduction of a BT eggplant, which would have dramatically reduced insecticide use there. And the result, of course, in the real world, rather than the imaginary world of the activists, the result in the real world is not that all the farmers growing eggplants suddenly turned organic, but they carried on doing what they'd always done before, which was in many cases to send around small children with buckets of pesticides to dip the fruit individually in, causing enormous amounts of residues, toxic residues in the crop, and also, of course, 
poisonings of these vulnerable young children who were involved in that practice. And all of this opposition ignores the clear evidence that we now have scientifically that the introduction of BT crops around the world has reduced insecticide use by about at least 10%, about 500 million kilograms insecticide um, saved since 1996. Uh, I don't know if you saw in the news, in the Philippines, there was a court judgment against BT eggplant just last month um, in a case which was put by Greenpeace, um, which was unable to produce any scientific evidence in support of their case. They just had to invoke the precautionary principle, and unfortunately, this rather gullible judge bought it. Also, in, in Africa, we have a major situation around the world where a lot of countries have taken their regulatory system ideas from Europe, which means nothing happens. There's either de facto moratoriums or formal ones. Um, as many of you know, um, in Kenya and Uganda, there's a bacterial, uh, there's a wilt disease which is devastating the staple uh, plantain crop. And governments there are still maintaining a GMO ban, which means actually the penalty for this is you could go, if you take this potentially life-saving new variety of banana out of the laboratory, you could go to jail for 10 years as a result of that. In my old homeland of Peru, um, a lot of the heirloom varieties of potatoes, which the activists are so proud of, they're pretty crappy and small and infested with disease and very low yielding. They may be ancient and are worth protecting for their genetic diversity, but you don't actually want to eat them or to be dependent on them constantly. And so there's a, the, the potato people have got together, the universities, the public sector universities, where they've, and they've created a GMO, disease-resistant potato. But what happened? Peru imposed a 10-year moratorium on all GM approvals. So it can't be used. Again, this is stuck in the laboratory because of widespread misconceptions and public superstition. And now we have a problem, which is that we are facing a situation where population growth and increasing economic growth means that we have to double food production um, to feed a population, a likely population of 9.5 billion people by 2050. And where already the increasing yields of cereals in this graph that we've seen over the last few decades, are, the lines are beginning to separate. We're seeing a stagnation in yield growth whilst the population growth continues to increase uninterrupted. Why is this? Well, it's not so much because people in poor countries are having too many children. That's another misconception here. The global average fertility rate is now down to about 2.4. And if you think about it, natural replacement is 2.1. So what's happening here, and the reason why the population is going up, is because largely because infant mortality is decreasing. More children are surviving to have children of their own as they grow up, rather than dying of preventable diseases like malaria or from contaminated water before the age of five. This, in my view, children surviving is a good thing, right? And not just because I'm a parent, I just think that's a good thing. So we are going to have to support this population. It's doing something about fertility is important, where people should have access to family planning, in my view. But we're not going to dramatically reduce the 9.5 billion population by reducing fertility. Those kids are going to be there, and this demographic bulge is going to come up, and we have to feed them. Now, if I think back to those malnourished children that I saw in Peru back in the early 1980s, I'm happy to report that poverty in that country has declined by 50% in just little more than a decade. Um, and there's dramatically similar rates of poverty reduction across sub-Saharan Africa, which is now the world's fastest growing continent. Um, and of course, in many parts of Asia as well. And now hundreds of millions of people in all of these parts of the developing world are beginning to join the middle class. Children who are growing up there today can expect better education, better health care, and overall better life opportunities than their parents might ever have dreamt of. And this is particularly the case if these children are girls. Um, take that Bangladeshi girl there. Her mother probably had very basic primary education. Her grandmother was probably never even allowed to leave the house. And so for the first time, she has the opportunity to put her brain power together in this newly interconnected world with the brown brain power of all of the other newly educated people and 
look at solving some of these real world challenges that we face today. Maybe she'll be the next Norman Borlaug. And I say this in front of uh, Norman Borlaug's um, granddaughter here. Uh, the man, this is the man who oddly is not a household name, despite the fact he won the Nobel Peace Prize for the Green Revolution and for saving a billion lives um, as a result of this agricult these agricultural innovations that he was a part of, of creating. So, what have, what have I learned in the last 15 years? Well, I've learned that you don't stop learning when you leave school. If anything, I've been on a steeper learning curve in the last few years than I ever was when I was studying history and politics at university. Um, and that's an amazing thing. I've discovered a whole fascinating new area of science, of molecular biology, um, of this amazing code of DNA which is shared amongst all living things, and how using this code can help us use biology to tackle um, problems of disease, problems of food production, working with nature rather than against it, in the words of Toby from Rothamsted in that YouTube video. Um, and I've learned that scientific evidence should be particularly valued where it contradicts your worldview rather than where it just supports it. Science's most valuable trait, in other words, that you, you might say, is that by definition, it challenges our inherent psychological tendency towards confirmation bias. Um, and I've, I guess I've also learned a bit about pragmatism, as you do when you get older, and how making the perfect the enemy of the good it's not just a recipe for failure, but oftentimes a recipe for disaster. And I guess I've also learned the value of optimism. Um, to misquote Churchill, as I like to do from, from time to time, um, optimists see solutions to every problem, while pessimists see problems in every solution. And I know which I'd rather be. And I guess at the root of all this lies the very humbling experience that I thought I'd never have, which is not just to go around criticizing other people's mistakes, but realizing how to acknowledge and learn from your own. Thank you very much.